Hi, welcome to Let's Talk Careers. I'm your host, Lisa Bauman. Today, I'm talking with Kevin Bell, who is the coordinator and professor of the Motive Power programs here at Conestoga College. Listen in as he talks about his journey from apprentice to educator and the future of the automotive industry. We talked about a key factor influencing his decision to pursue a second career and also what it takes to break into the industry. I hope you enjoy. Welcome. <laughs> I'm going to get you to introduce yourself um, and using the what I call the James Bond elevator pitch. And uh, we're happy to have you here. Perfect. Thanks very much for the invite. I'm looking forward to this podcast. Uh, my name is Kevin, Kevin Bell. I'm the program coordinator for the automotive programs at our Guelph campus location, which nice. is where most of our motive power programs operate out of. Yeah, wonderful. And what are you passionate about? I really like doing something the right way. Nice. There's, there's lots of different ways to get to the end result, to get to the end game. Um, but there's right ways and wrong ways to do it. And yes, there's shortcuts, but shortcuts usually wind up causing issues or grief down the road. Uh, and I constantly say to my students, you know, you start cutting corners and you wind up with a circle Absolutely. and that's exactly what you turn a square into. So doing something the right way goes a long way to me. And yes, it may take a little bit longer, but especially with apprentices and students, uh, understanding the correct method of doing it will get you to the the end result that you need. Yeah. I love it. I love that you can, by cutting corners, you can create a square into a circle. Yeah. I think that's a brilliant analogy. Um, so let's dive in. I want to start with like early days. And so I'm sure you've heard, you know, the phrase, what did you want to be when you grew up? So I'm curious to know, um, starting sort of from those early days, moving into some of your early career decisions, maybe post-secondary journey, all of that stuff. I had no idea what I wanted to be as a kid. Um, I just kind of naturally fell into something mechanical. Um, my father was an engineer by trade, a civil engineer. So that's where some of my analytical thinking and my mechanical background from came from, although my Father had no interest in cars, no interest in mechanical hobbies. He just understood physics and understood mechanics. But I can remember at early ages, I just wanted to take things apart and see how they worked. And if I was lucky enough, I'd put them back together and they'd work again. Everything from little, you know, Lego motors to radio controlled cars. And I just really liked seeing how things work and, and what the input and what the output was. So I guess it was ingrained in me from a very young age, not because I was taught that, but it was just something I was kind of interested in and passionate about. And then as I got older, I started taking an interest in, well, then it was bicycles and then it was cars and it was just a natural migration to get into the automotive industry or get into the repair industry. And when I first decided this is what I want to do and this is, you know, the path I'm going to take, my dad wasn't really too thrilled about it because he kind of wanted me to go to the engineering side of things and, and follow in his footsteps. And I just didn't have the interest in, in, getting to that level or going down that road, I was much more, there was much more reward when I could work on something and I could fix it within half an hour right. or an hour or a couple of hours. Right. The, the end result of the reward was, it was right there. You could see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so I, you know, continued my schooling. I actually changed schools towards the end of my high school years because the school I was at didn't have any mechanical programs. They had uh, small industrial arts programs, but it was woodworking and welding. And I had taken all of those. So my last year of high school, I, uh, I flipped to another school which had auto shop and I just needed six cred credits of anything. So I would go in the auto door. I came out the auto door. I took auto, auto and auto. I saw none of the rest of the school and wow. it was just automotive. Yeah. And part of that was co-op. Yes. And they placed me at a, a service center for a co-op term. And okay. that worked out really well for me. The, uh, I guess previous co-op students hadn't been terribly successful. It was just a program for them. It was just a way to get her to school, right. but I had already decided this is what I wanted to do. So I was reasonably passionate about it. Plus I had a car at that point and I was okay. doing a lot of, you know, my own maintenance on the vehicle and my first car was older than I was. Cool. So that kind of gives you an idea of what kind of maintenance something <laughs> yes. of that, uh, that was vintage it made of required. Steel? It was steel. Uh, nice. and as my Wait. dad used to call it a piece of pig iron, cause it was an old American car. Wait, what, what car was it? It was a 1969 Dodge Dart. Nice. Uh, and it was nothing, you know, classic other than the age. It was four doors. It was a six cylinder and it wasn't even the big six cylinder. It was a small six cylinder, okay. but that car taught me a lot of valuable lessons. And number one being, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
because all I wanted to do was tinker with it. I, I, this isn't leaking, but it's probably never been replaced. So I should take it apart and replace that gasket and snap, break, you learn from it. And there were a whole bunch of learning curves all along the way. So that was, that was the beginning of my passion and being able to apply it. And yeah, my co-op term worked well. And they then took me on as an apprentice when I finished that. And I was at that shop for the remainder of my apprenticeship and all the way through till I, till I got my license. So can I ask where, where geographically were you when you did this? So I grew up in Toronto. Okay. I grew up in the, uh, the area of uh, Don Mills and well, Lawrence and Don Valley Parkway. So Don Mills and Lawrence area. So uh, fairly well to do community. I mean, lots of, you know, amenities uh, in your backyard, lots of nice houses and everything ranged from, you know, blue collar workers like myself, all the way up to the more exquisite or the, the white collar industry. Sure. Um, and I really enjoyed working yeah. in the community because a lot of the customers that I had when I was working at that service center, which was also in Don Mills, I used to deliver newspapers to them as a kid. So they would come in and, hey, I haven't seen you in years because it would be in the neighborhood or around the block and, and we don't cross paths on a regular basis. And obviously at this stage in my career, I had given up the newspaper route. Um, but yeah, it, it was really nice to make that connection and, and then they would go back and tell their neighbors, hey, remember the kid that used to deliver our newspapers or shovel our driveway when we had snowstorms? And those were all the things that I enjoyed doing as a kid. And, and now that, that rapport is kind of coming back uh, to, to, you know, another, another lap or to complete itself. That's, that's cool. So that cool. was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's cool. And I, I really liked, so actually it's interesting that you had to change high schools to get to the courses that you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think I'm not too sure about the public system now, but I think there's more and more co-op. I was actually one of, I think one of the first co-op kids when it was introduced back in the eighties, mm -hmm. <laughs> believe it or not. And yeah. This, this would have been late eighties for me. Yeah. yeah. So you might've been one of the first ones too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and, uh, I did, I did a co-op and I have a strong advocacy for co-op high school, college level, you know, university, what have you. I think they're incredible for giving you that, um, initial career exposure, exposure right. Yeah. To see if this is something that you liked. Yep. So what did you, so you did your co-op, you got hired as an apprentice. How long does the apprenticeship take? At that point, it was hours based. Uh, today's apprenticeship program is a little bit different. They've modified it over the years. But at that point, it was hours based. And it starts off with a 9,000 hour contract. Okay. And then they, the ministry will apply credits to that contract based on how many years of high school have you completed past grade 10. Because at that point, grade 10 was the minimum requirement for apprenticeship. Now it's grade 12. You have to have your, your secondary school diploma. So I had a whole series of credits applied to that because I had taken auto courses. I had completed my grade 12. I did the co-op course. So my contract was set up for 5,600 hours. So it should have been nice and quick and short. And I could have been able or should have been able to knock that off in about two and a half years. But it was late 80s, early 90s. And that's when the economy started to take a bit of a downturn. So I wasn't working 45-hour weeks. I was working 30-hour weeks. Well, I lived around the corner from where I worked. It was. I was complacent at that point because I didn't have car payments. I didn't have a whole lot of debt. Sure, I was paying rent. I was now working, but it wasn't a huge piece of my income. And well, I like working there. I like the people I work with. So I'm going to continue, continue working. So when you're doing 30 hour weeks instead of 45 hour weeks, it takes you a little bit longer, uh, but it was nice. I would come in at 12 o'clock in the afternoon so I could hang out with my friends in the evening and not have to worry about getting up at the crack of dawn for work. So all of that took a little bit of toll. So it ended up taking about five years for me to complete my apprenticeship, which was about a year and a half longer than it realistically should have. But no harm, no foul. At the end of the day, it all worked out. And yep. uh, yeah, the rest is history. Okay. But wait, we got to talk more about that history. <laughs> <laughs> so you're there, you're in the apprenticeship, you, you're, you're still with the shop that you're working with. Yep. Uh, did you stay there? Yep. How, okay, how long? I was there for, well, I would have started as a co-op student in about 89. Okay. Uh, and I lasted right up until about the summer of, two, uh, sorry, 95. Okay. So I was there about six years, give or take a little bit. Uh, and that was my apprenticeship years. And I wrote my license and uh, got my, my certificate of qualification in the winter of 1995. Uh, and then I left there in the summer of 1995. Things were still kind of not deteriorating, but, you know, the business wasn't doing really well. The economy was better in some areas than the others. And I had, I realized that that's as far as I'm going to go in this place. I, guys I work with were fantastic, but I'm not going to gain any more. There's no, there's no room for progression. 
Um, so there was another shop. Uh, so I, you know, took a few weeks off or I was laid off actually. And that's okay. Spring summer's here. I'll take a few weeks off. I'll enjoy some downtime. And word got around that, uh, I was looking for a job and I was unemployed and I actually had shops calling me thanks to our local parts supplier and say, Hey, we, we hear you're looking for a job. Why don't you come up and have a chat with us? So I uh, ended up working at a, a Goodyear shop out in Thornhill for about two and a half or three years. And Went out and visited with them and they said, yep, can you start next week? I'm like, yeah, okay, I can start next week. And, you know, we negotiated some, some hours back and forth and I worked there for about two and a half or three years. And it was, and I, it was great because they had a bigger clientele. Um, they were a little more progressive than the shop I had come from. So there was better equipment. We were working on newer cars and I was working with other guys who were, were fairly strong in the repair and the diagnostics. So as a team, we had a really good team when I worked there. The shop that I had worked at originally and did my co-op and my apprenticeship with, it had since um, gone, I won't say belly up, but it had since closed its doors and then it was being re reopened under new ownership. So after about two and a half years, I still lived in the same area and I saw the signs under new management opening next month. And I thought, hmm. So I went to figure out who the new management was and it turns out it was a, an individual who had another station down the street and this was a, a shell franchise. So he had another station down the street. So I went and chatted with him and he said, well, I, I've got a couple of people lined up, but yeah, I, I'd consider hiring you. And so, you know, here's what we can work out. So I thought, great, I'm going to get to go back to my original, you know, proving grounds yeah. and see the same customers and, and bring them back in again and kind of start things from the ground up and ended up running that shop for about five years. So it worked really well because he had a shop down the street and he would come down once a day, sign a couple of checks make sure that everything was in order and then he'd head back to his shop. So I had all the the luxuries of owning my own business without the financial responsibilities of gotcha. it. Gotcha. Yeah. So let me just bear with me a minute. I want to, I want to step back a minute because you said something really important. I want to dive in just a little bit more. You were talking about when you made that change, you were laid off, you made that change and you had a connection with the part suppliers mm -hmm. and that then led you to the next opportunity. Yep. So how did that kind of, what would you say would be the thing that made that the, the piece that led to the next step? Like, was it the building of the relationships? Was it the connections? Was it, you know, it was, it was probably a little bit of everything. It was, you know, not burning any bridges anywhere. Right? Yes. I didn't go marching out the door. Yes. And we, we, as I said, we, we had a really good dynamic yep. uh, at the, at the station that I was working at. Um, we had two or three main parts suppliers that we used and they had representatives that would come by every couple of weeks to make sure, you know, do you have any cores to go back? Was there any warranty issues with any of the parts? And so they built a relationship with the, with the shop and I knew who they were. And I mean, I was just a, I was a licensed tech or an apprentice, but I knew who they were and they knew who I was. So when I got laid off, they very quickly got wind of it because they would come by and, oh yeah, Kevin got laid off last week and I'll keep my ears open. And, and they just knew from dealing with the shop that this is somebody I wouldn't mind promoting because they, they the, the rapport at the shop was that, yeah, he's, he's a good tech and it's unfortunate we had to lay him off. But so then the, the parts guys who visit the shops on a regular basis, they would just spread the word. And right. this, uh, this one shop picked up on that and they yeah. reached out to me. So I'm curious, right? So this is back nineties. This would right? have been, yeah, 95. And a lot of people say when they're sort of searching for searching for jobs or what have you, they'd be like, Oh, you got to apply. You got to do this. So, if you were to, th would you su suggest that that building of relationships and networking, contacting with people and, you know, being knowledgeable, being helpful is, is a, is a something that can still be applied in today in terms of the way that we search for jobs and do that kind of stuff. Do you see what absolutely, I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, networking, especially today with social media goes, there, there's so many more connections or so many more avenues that you can connect with to, to put yourself out there or, you know, just to get to know people. And, and I, I frequently refer to the, the, the whole process as a bit of a pyramid. So you start off as a co-op student or an apprentice and well, you go to school with a whole bunch of other apprentices and, and there's maybe a whole bunch of people in the shop. But when you want to take things to the next level, when you're striving for that extra little piece of information or a little more knowledge or a little more diagnostic skills, and you're taking some courses on your own, right? It's after hours. Hey, Part supplier is hosting a, a training course and I, I want to know about that and I'll go if you'll pay for it. And the boss, yeah, okay, I'll pay for it. You go. And when you start attending these courses on a regular basis, you start seeing the same people, but it's now the next level of that pyramid. 
and then you get to another elevation or another point where now you're a little more involved in maybe you know, helping other people diagnose or fix vehicles, or they're calling you for a little bit of information. And now you've reached that next level. And that pyramid continues to get smaller and smaller and smaller, but you continue to see, see the same group of people over and over and over. And that goes a long way if you ever needed to fall back on that, or you ever needed to reference, or you ever needed people. It's cliche when you say, you know, never give up an opportunity or never miss an opportunity. You know, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. If the opportunity is there to attend a training course, take it. If the opportunity is there to network with a group, take it. If there's a open house at a parts supplier, and I, I reference parts suppliers because that was kind of the, the norm for our industry, um, take it, right? And, and network and just understand and you will meet people and know people and you never know what opportunity may come out of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's still good wisdom, Absolutely. even today, yep. <laughs> even today. Okay. So you've shifted to employers. You're back in your home ground. You get this pleasure of sort of running the business without having to have that financial piece. Yep. What then happens next? Because it was a, uh, a franchise, because it was a shell station, there was a, uh, a time limit on the lease that we had uh, with the, with the landowner. And we knew that at some point that was probably going to come to an end because Don Mills was undergoing some growth and they were redeveloping a lot of the local businesses. They were redeveloping um, buildings. They were redeveloping the, the mall that was beside us. So we kind of knew that that day we're not going to be here for another 10 or 15 years. Uh, and it got to the point where uh, Shell said, well, we, we would like to renew the lease. And the, uh, the, the landowner said, uh, okay, we'll give you a month to month lease. I'm like, well, we can't really build a business on a month to month lease. Like if we're going to put any money into the business, we need to make sure that we're here long enough to be able to, to get that back out of the business. So, uh, Shell had said, no, we're not really re interested in a month to month lease. And they, they terminated or the, the lease finally came to an end. And I ended up transitioning down the street to where the, the owner or the lessee had his other business because it was also a Shell station but they were still still going because their land wasn't being developed. And so we kind of amalgamated the two businesses and, and that worked well too, but it was a very different clientele. Even though it was only three or four kilometers down the street, it was the other side of Eglinton Avenue. It was a completely different clientele and it wasn't quite as much fun. You were always fighting for the jobs. And I don't mean fighting amongst yourselves, but it was a struggle to, well, this is what you need. Well, that, that's too much money. I can get that done down the street. No, right. no you can't because there's nobody down the street. I just came from down the street. Right. There's nobody there's there nobody that will there. do that for you. Yeah. Okay. And I just, I always found myself kind of fighting tooth and nail, trying to, trying to sell that job. And, and I'm, I'm trying to be the best tech I can. And I'm trying to, you know, make sure that you're putting the good brakes on your car and make sure that we're supplying quality parts. But when you have a financial ceiling and customers don't necessarily want to spend that much money and they see the newspaper ads that hey I can get a brake job for 9995 and I'm quoting nearly double that they don't know what that 9995 brake job entails there'll be all kinds of hidden costs behind that so that turned into a, a struggle but I still enjoyed who I was working for um the the owner was a fantastic guy to work for and I still keep in touch with him today um but it got to the point where yeah I've I think I've kind of I've had enough time and I had at that point moved out to the West end of Toronto. So I was no longer living in Don Mills. So it was a one and a half hour commute into work, a one and a half hour commute home. That's three hours a day times five days a week. That's 15 hours is a lot of leisure time that I'm spending on the road. Uh, so again, through a connection, somebody else said, Hey, why don't you come work for me? I'm in Mississauga. You're in Milton. Come and work for me for a while or, you know, come and work for me. And he dangled the carrot and dangled the carrot. And finally, I had to jump at the opportunity because it was, again, a progressive move. It was a newer shop. It was modern. It had all the modern equipment. Um, they had a, a, a very well-to-do clientele. We weren't working on, you know, 15-year-old rusty cars. We were yep. working on nice, new, modern cars. And, yep. and they were always private shops that had worked out. So I've never been in a dealer life or a dealer environment. So I've okay. seen everything from, you know, 40 or 50-year-old classics yep. to... 20 year old rust buckets that are cobbled together with bubble gum and shoestring mm -hmm. all the way up to, Hey, my that car was, is three or four years out of warranty. That was my 1979 Chevette. <laughs> yeah. You know, bubble gum and shoestring holds a lot, holds a lot together. You'd be surprised. <laughs> so yeah, then I transitioned to a, to a shop in Mississauga okay. and I worked there for about two and a half, three years. Um, enjoyed the environment, enjoyed working, but I was now getting up to my late thirties and thinking, 
what else do I want to do for a career when I get into my 40s and my 50s? Because working on, on the bench, working on the floor, it's, it's taxing on the body and you're working in heat and you're working in cold and you're constantly bending over and you're slugging away at heavy things. And I still really enjoyed what I was doing and enjoyed where I was working, but I was looking around for something else to do. And I had no idea what else I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to take the experience that I had and somehow apply that somewhere else, whether it was some type of you know, engineering opportunity, although I realized I was going to have to transition back to school and university, and I just wasn't sure if I could cope with that at that point. Um, I gave it some thought, and uh, an opportunity came up to try teaching at, uh, at a college in Toronto. So I thought, sure, why not? It's a, it's a one-year contract. I know it's not full-time. It's not permanent. But I've got my license. I've got a good following. I haven't burned any bridges. I can always get back into the trade because if you've got a certificate, you are always going to be valuable if you've got that, that trade qualification. Yeah. So I took the opportunity to try teaching for a year and I, I taught the apprenticeship program and really enjoyed it. And it was, I was green as green can get getting into it. And it was just not, I would come home and I'd be prepping tomorrow's lesson. And I'm literally a couple of hours ahead of the students right. as far as the lesson goes. Yeah, I know as the feeling. anybody <laughs> who has got into teaching yep. has experienced. Yep. But after I started doing a little bit of repetition and it started to fall into place and I was getting reasonable feedback and the students liked and the other faculty that I was working with were fantastic and supportive. And I thought this is, and then the next year came around and they said, hey, here's another contract. So I did it for another year and then I did it for a third year. So I was three years uh, part-time or, or sessional contract. And that th this is my next career. This is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. So I was looking at the trifecta of colleges that were within a reasonable commute of where I lived in Milton and Conestoga had an opportunity and I applied for it and not to blow my own horn, but apparently I blew the interview committee away. Because when I had to have an interview with the chair, when all was said and done, who wasn't able to attend the interview, he came to me or he called me up and he said, so, you know, my, my interview committee was really impressed. So I need to meet you in person. So I went in and I met Stephen in person and yeah, they offered me the job and the rest is history. And I've been with Congress, Conestoga since 2008. That's amazing. So you had some interesting career sort of decision-making along the way. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about what the main factor was in making that career decision to get out of the trade and to go into this teaching piece. So you talked a little bit about, you know, sort of looking at your age and your physical abilities, mm -hmm. those types of things. Maybe you can talk a little bit about sort of what was, what were all the factors in making that, that shift? My perspective, probably starting in my apprenticeship years was to, and, and my dad would be proud of this because set a goal. Like, and it doesn't have to be a goal for today or tomorrow, but set a goal. And my goal when I was going through my apprenticeship, because my dad wasn't really fond of the industry that I'd select or I'd chosen to get into. Mom was, your dad doesn't think you're going to follow through with it. Well, I was determined to follow through with this and get my, get my license. So my goal was to be licensed by the time I was 25. And then I just literally by about 24 hours made that goal. So I wrote my certificate of qualification on the day before my 25th birthday. So I made that goal and then I was working away at it. Well, what's my 30 goal? What's my 35 goal? What's my 40 goal? So I had these five-year goals and they weren't all career related. Some of them were, hey, by the time I'm 30, I'd like to be in a house. I'd like to you know, be a homeowner by the time I'm 30. And by the time I'm 35, I would like to make sure that, you know, if I'm going to start a family, that's probably a sound time to start a family. And by the time I'm 40, so I had all these goals all the way along. And I knew that by the time I was getting up to 45 or 50, I was going to have a different goal set because I probably didn't want to continue with this career just based on the, the physical demands on the body. So I kind of decided by the time I was 40, I wanted to figure out what my next career was going to be. And I didn't necessarily have to be in it. But I wanted to know what I what I needed to put in place to get there. Uh, and it just worked out really well that I was able to take that contract at the other college and yeah. do that for three years. And then it migrated into Conestoga. Yeah. And so I managed to hit that goal. Yeah. Why teaching, though? I mean, because and maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Like when you go from being in a trade, a lot of people think, OK, that's it. Right. I'm going to be in the trade. I'm going to be doing this forever. And they're not. Well, I've seen a few people struggle to make that next step decision. It wasn't something that I had ever 
forecasted. It wasn't yeah. something I had ever strived for. In fact, during my, you know, licensed years or my bench years, if someone had said, you should get into teaching. Me? Teaching? That'd be ridiculous. That's not something I want to do. I, I'm no good at that. But looking back on it, over the years, I've had customers who, you know, come in and pick up their car and I'm giving them a brief explanation as to why we had to replace this part and what it does. And I've had customers say, that, that's a really great description. Thanks for taking the time. You should consider a, a career in teaching. And not that that ever planted the seed, but looking back on it, well, maybe I did have something. And, and I've always enjoyed talking. And, yeah. and, you know, ask, how do you know when you're sitting beside a teacher? Don't worry, they'll tell you. Right? <laughs> I've always enjoyed it's talking. True. And I've always, you know, and it, it got to a point where I would enjoy educating friends because mm. I had you know, lots of friends growing up, but not all of them or many of them got into the trade or got into the industry or were mechanical, but they would then trust me or rely on me to, Hey, my car's doing this. Can I bring it in? Can you have a look at it? And I really enjoyed kind of explaining to them and, and educating to them because they were interested. They just didn't have the understanding or the training that I did. And I really kind of enjoyed that. And when I decided to pull that trigger on teaching and try that out, I had a lot of friends say, that's, that's perfect for you. Cause you are always doing that. Whether you realize it or not, you are always trying to extend that knowledge. And so, yeah, I, I guess it was a natural, but it's not something that I would have considered when I was, you know, on the bench or when I was working away at things. Yeah. Yeah. Let's shift into the industry just a little bit. Cause I'm, cause it's like, to me, this automotive industry actually is really fascinating. There's going to be some big impacts coming. <laughs> um, and so I want to talk, you know, what, what are your thoughts about kind of getting into the industry? What skills you think you need to kind of get into that industry? You know, how do you get your foot in the door into that position? Those types of things. Let's start there. And then I'm going to shift a little bit. <laughs> You're right. The industry is, is changing by leaps and bounds. And every time there's one little piece of advancement in technology that affords 15 new features on a vehicle, right? And we're at a point where we're starting to see EV, uh, e vehicles, right? Electric vehicles or battery hybrid vehicles. And that is really becoming the forefront. Is it the answer? No, but it's certainly the way things are going to go for the next 15 or 20 years until hydrogen starts to become the norm. Um, now would be a great time or is a great time to get into the industry because if you're reasonably fresh out of high school, you've probably, well, I guarantee you've been, you've been brought up around gadgets and tablets and devices. And the aptitude is probably already there for a little bit of opening this, finding out where that setting is, drilling down to make something work, especially if you've dabbled in any type of, you know, Android devices where you can, you can fine tune things and customize them. Well, the automotive industry, while you're not necessarily fine tuning and customizing, you do have to have an understanding of, of how computers work, how software works, how programming works, because there's always going to be breaks. There's always going to be the mechanical repairs, but so much more, more of it has shifted towards the, the software side of things. And now when you have one module that doesn't work, it takes down an entire network and there's 25 things on the car that don't work. And there isn't a scan tool in the world that you're going to be able to plug in or a crystal ball that is going to tell you, oh, you need to look at that module. You need to have the, the mindset to understand, okay, what's not working and start reverse engineering it to figure out, well, what if this component failed? Or what if maybe if I tried this? So there's a lot of reverse engineering and it's a great time to get into it because a lot of students coming you know, reasonably fresh out of high school will probably have that aptitude underlying and We've talked about this on some of the other discussions I've had over the years, that it's not necessarily the mechanical aspect that is drawing people towards cars now. You could be someone who's really interested in programming, um, whether you're you know, programming small uh, Arduinos or you're using Raspberry Pi or any, anything that's basic like that. But now you get into the automotive side and maybe you get into the, the electrical diagnostics. So you're not doing the mechanical side of things. But now you're plugging in and you're understanding the programming or you're understanding how to customize some of the features. Uh, being able to take a, an electric vehicle, pull up the app on your phone and summons that vehicle from across the parking lot. It's that kind of connectivity that is really attractive to some. So they may not be car people through and through, but they love that connectivity. They love to be able to physically touch something here and make something work over there. And if that's their aptitude or if that's their interest, 
then absolutely there's a position in the automotive industry for so that. So given the fact that the automobiles <laughs> are constantly changing, um, new models, new technologies, new pieces coming into play, as a person in the industry, how do you keep up with that learning? How do you keep up with the changes of those, of that, the, yeah, that, it's, those changes? It's challenging. I mean, it's, it's much easier from a dealership level okay. because dealerships, they're the ones that see the 23 models, the 24 models, the yep. 25 models, and they need their technicians to be trained on them. So they have dealership training. And okay. Most of the time at a dealership level, you're expected to participate in that training. Okay. For example, if you're going to start working on the hybrids, well, you can't just bring one in and start working on it. You right. need to be certified right. by their training standards. Okay. So how uh, does a shop person so not? A private shop or private industry is a little more challenging. Now, okay. having said that, they're not seeing 23s, 24s, 25s. Right. They don't see them roll into their door until they're outside of that warranty period, right. which is usually three to five years down the road. Right. So it's not cutting edge technology anymore, but maybe the newest vehicle they're working on is a 2017 and now a 2021 rolls in the door because it's just out of warranty. And that three or four year gap, there's a whole different wrath of the, the gadgetry and the technology. And, and we've got, you know, all the, the ADAS systems, the advanced driver assist systems, which consist of adaptive cruise control and the lane keep assist and the blind spot monitoring. And the list goes on and on and on. You don't see those on a 2017, but you absolutely see those on a 2021. So all of a sudden there's this, this wave of technology and it can be overwhelming. There are programs available. I shouldn't say programs. There are courses that are usually offered by a lot of the part suppliers in the aftermarket. There's updated training courses on, hey, this one is dealing with modern day HVAC systems. This one is dealing with the adaptive cruise control systems. This one is dealing with the stability control systems. This one is dealing with reprogramming. This one is dealing with, you know, the new eight speed, nine speed, 10 speed transmissions. I'd said it previously, never pass up an opportunity to, to improve or to, to take a course or to, to upgrade yourself. And while the shop may not be necessarily progressive enough to be pushing this on their techs, if the techs are aware of the training or the techs want that upgrading, hey, let's make a deal. I'll spend, spend my evening, my three or four hours of my free time taking the course if you'll pay for the course. And most employers will, will absolutely jump yeah, on that yeah. opportunity because it's, it's a yeah. no-brainer. You know what I see my kids doing is I see them YouTubing everything. What there's, are you? there's good and bad to that. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and as we're all aware that, you know, anybody can post almost anything on YouTube. Yeah. Um, and it means reading through three, four, five different YouTube videos. And it's a fantastic resource when you want to know how something works or you, ha you want to know how to take something apart. But it's certainly not the best resource out there because there may be step, uh, steps that are skipped. There may be people that are really not qualified to be making that decision or making that video. And now someone's going to do something incorrectly. And I'm not a big fan of that when it comes to serious automotive repair. You want to diagnose a check engine light? Have at it all day long, watch all the videos, all the TikToks, all the YouTubes you want. But you want to learn how to do your own brakes or replace some of your own suspension components. It's not just you that's at risk anymore. Right. Now you got four or 5,000 pounds of metal rolling down the road, and that could absolutely impact others around you if it's not done properly. And this goes back to, you know, doing things properly and doing things the right way. And this is why the apprenticeship program is, is important because it teaches apprentices this is the, the minimum standard you have to reach and achieve. And this is why, because if things aren't done properly, wheels fall off. And we've all heard those news stories and news reports. So uh, I'm not a huge fan of, you know, YouTube is great for, I'm looking for a, my fuse keeps blowing, or I'm looking for why my air conditioning doesn't work. But when you start getting into the people that are trying to teach you how to do brakes and wheels and steering and suspension, now that becomes a huge safety issue. It's a, it's, it's a tough it's a tough line to draw and well, who's liable? Well, I saw it on YouTube or this is the way it was done. And I, you know, I've gone there myself to try and figure out how to take certain things apart or how to, you know, diagnose certain things, not necessarily automotively, but maybe, you know, I've got a problem with my furnace at home, but I know where to draw the line. I'm not going to put anybody else at risk or I'm not going to start doing things that, yeah, if this goes south, it may not end well. Exactly. So if, you know, I'm thinking about, I have a son who's kind of thinking in this area and 
you know, he wants to get into this field. How would he get in? How would he get his foot in the door? What would be some of the things to do to get their foot in the door? Two different ways that you can get into the trade or into, and it's not just the automotive industry, but you know, heavy equipment, power sports, uh, truck and coach, a lot of the trades. The apprenticeship route is the traditional route. Uh, the apprenticeship route means that you need to find an employer. So you take your credentials, your high school diploma, maybe some job experience that you've had co-op, put that on a resume. And you start cold calling and you're going to, you know, hit up employers and tell them you would like to start an apprenticeship. Yeah. Cold calling is the idea. You just pick up the phone and call somebody and And you don't know them. Even better in person. (laughs) Yes. Um, I mean, you and I came from an in-person environment. Yes. Right. We grew up in person. We didn't have devices. We didn't have video conferencing. We didn't have text messaging. So we're still of that in-person generation. Right. And most of the employers out there are probably of a similar mindset they would way rather see somebody come in in person, walk in, introduce themselves. Here's my resume. I'd like to start an apprenticeship. Any possibilities, any opportunities? Because you pick up a phone and make that call. It is not going to have the same weight behind it. Or if you send an email in, that's just going to wind up in an inbox somewhere. And yeah, it may be valuable and they may collect it. But man, you come in person to person and you make that face-to-face connection, that will go a long way in establishing a relationship right off the bat that that could very well turn into an apprenticeship piece. So traditional apprenticeship, you go cold calling. The other course, obviously, and Conestoga amongst a lot of others are doing this, are the post-secondary programs. And they will appeal to students who have recently finished high school or just finished high school. But now if you're leaving high school and you're trying to start an apprenticeship, you're competing against everybody else who is leaving high school. And the employers know that there's a huge range of how automotive courses are taught at a high school level. So it's great that you took some trades in technology. It's great that you took one or two years of auto, but what did you actually do? By taking a post-secondary course and graduating with a certificate or with a diploma, now you've got some credentials under your belt and that will put you head and shoulders above other people that are applying for the same job, which maybe don't have the credentials. Um, It skews things a little bit as far as timing goes, because yes, you're going to spend one year at college or you're going to spend two years at college. But most of the time, that time spent here is only going to benefit you and you become way more productive when you get into the trade. And that's what the employers are looking for. That's the feedback that we hear from our program advisory committees is we really need to see the basic skill sets. So because like it or not, you start off in the industry, you're going to start off at the ground level. Right. The only job you ever start at the top is when you're digging a hole. You're going to start off at the bottom. You're going to be doing services, oil changes, tires. And a lot of that seems repetitious, but it's a foundation and you need to prove yourself. And the day will come yeah. as an apprentice that you yep. can prove yourself to the yep. employer. And I've got all kinds of stories about that. Too. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you think is the best skill a young person can come into, into that apprenticeship? What would you say would be the best skill if they were to like, hone in any of their skill sets, what would be the best skill to walking in? sum it a- up in two words would be work ethics. Um, they don't necessarily have to have all of the knowledge, all of the smarts, all of the aptitude. That can all be taught, but they have to come in there willing to learn and they want to learn. And time to lean, time to clean, all right? Nobody's ever going to, you know, lay you off or fire you because you are holding a broom right? Find something to do, whether it's doing a little bit of cleaning or sweeping on the side, whether it's, okay, my job is done. I'm going to go over and see what the license tech is working on. Hey, tell me what you're doing. You know, teach me what this is. You show the initiative and there's always somebody looking and employers will pick up on that. And not every single employer is, you know, some of them are just, it becomes a mill and you just, you know, run one apprentice after the other until you find somebody you're happy with. And again, that's kind of part of the apprenticeship path, but there are lots of great employers out there. And, and I've been fortunate. I've always had really good employers to work for. Um, I've never burned any bridges. I've never, and I still keep in touch with as many of, you know, previous coworkers and employers as I can. So the, the, the want or the drive to learn that is, that is in the forefront. Yeah. You talked a little bit about some of the, the technology impacting this industry, you know, and we talked a little bit about the, you know, sort of the future you mentioned, um, sorry, hydrogen would be the the next level of, yeah. of propulsion. So yeah. where do you think the industry is going? Where do you think this industry is going? Electric cars, and I know a lot of people are not fans of the electric vehicle, but I think it's 
possibly because they don't have an understanding of it's foreign to them. They don't know how they work. And there's always the argument that it's not that environmentally, uh, environmentally friendly because of the, the mining process and what it takes to make the battery. And what are you going to do with that battery after 10 years? There is, it is without a doubt, a way more efficient way to propel a vehicle forward. And just to use a couple of, I uh, won't say statistics, but facts, your internal combustion engine is at best about 35 to 40 percent efficient, which means that for every dollar you put into your fuel tank, 35 to 40 cents is actually pushing the car forward. The other 60 to 65 cents, we're giving it away in heat. We're giving it away in friction. We have radiators to get rid of the heat that my internal combustion engine produced. I'm not using that heat to move the car forward. So internal combustion engines are horribly inefficient. You take an electric vehicle, they're about 90 to 95% efficient. So every dollar that charges that car, about 90 to 95 cents of that dollar is actually pushing the car forward. There's very little friction losses. There's very little heat. And there's way, few, way fewer moving parts in that vehicle. And they're actually much simpler and much easier to repair because there's so many less moving parts. Um, you know, I, I took a training seminar a couple of months ago and one of the manufacturers had said, hey, look at this, this new camshaft we developed. They've taken what used to be a one-piece device and turned it into about 36 different moving components that are going to spin at about 4,000 RPM. Like They're going the other direction. They're putting more moving parts on the car, whereas electric vehicles, you've got one, maybe two electric motors. You've got a simple differential. You've got a battery. You've got some controllers. Um, so electric vehicles, hybrid electric vehicles, they're absolutely the way of the future. Um, it just makes more sense. And as... Our infrastructure gets stronger and stronger and stronger. It will be able to support it. And I realize there's always the infrastructure issue. As the manufacturing process, the technology improves, the batteries are going to get better and better and better. We're going to get more longevity out of it. And then hydrogen is going to be the next. Uh, Toyota has been working on hydrogen for several decades. Um, there are four or five hydro filling stations that are supposed to be uh, on hydro filling, sorry, hydrogen filling stations that are supposed to be developed in Ontario within the next three to five years. Um, hydrogen is, is well, I mean, it's, it's there. You've, we've got it in water. You have a glass of water and you're having some hydrogen with it. So breaking that hydrogen out and using that to propel the vehicles forward, it's zero emissions. There's almost nothing involved in the production of it. Yes, there is transportation and getting the hydrogen in there, which is a bit of a complication. Hydrogen occupies a lot more space than a, a conventional 60, 70, 80 liter gas tank would. So there still are some drawbacks to it. The range isn't quite as far. If you want the range, then you're going to have to have a much bigger tank. So, but just like battery technology, look at the first generation, you know, battery electric vehicles. They didn't get far. I mean, I'll go back to the 90s and talk about the GM EV1, the first all electric vehicle that was really only available in California. Everybody that had one loved it but it was a leased vehicle and they all had to give them up at the end of the lease. But they loved that. But the car would only go about 125 kilometers and then you had to plug it in to recharge it. Look where we are today compared to that. So hydrogen will be the next step and the technology advancing is, is going to contribute to that. Yeah. So I'm curious to, to know, how would you describe your, the sort of the stage of your career that you're at now? How would you describe that stage or phase? It's... It's almost gone full circle. I mean, okay. I can remember my trade school when I was going through my apprenticeship, my level one and my level two and level three training and sitting in on the class and the, the classmates that I had and the delivery and the instruction that was on the other side of it and not maybe taking it quite as seriously as I should have. Okay. It's part of the apprenticeship program. You have to go to trade school. You have to have X number of hours of in-school training or teaching. And yeah, I enjoyed it when I was, when I was there in level one, I was like, woohoo, I'm a college student. This is great. And then I returned for level two. I'm like, yeah, this, this is good. This is okay. Admittedly, by the time I got to level three, I was get me in, get me done, get me out. I'm, I'm close to being licensed. And I, I want this, this final piece of the puzzle, the final piece of the pie. And now I'm on the other side of that desk. Now I'm looking at students and, you know, put your phone away or what do you think of this or what's the answer to that? And I told you this last week and I'm flashing back 30 years, 35 years and remembering the type of student I was. And so I've, I've literally almost gone full circle. Um, and as I'd said before, I had no intention of, of getting into the teaching industry or making this a second career for me. 
but it is kind of comical when I, I, I have those flashback moments or I see a student, I'm like, yeah, that's the kind of student that I was. That's, yeah. that's who I was sitting in there. And yeah, they, they grasp it, but they're not focused. They're, they're, they're here because they have to be, not because they want to be. Um, there are some students that, yeah, they are dead focused and they just, they're sponges and they want to absorb everything and pick your brains, but that's not the norm. Most of them are there and they'll pick up on things and they'll do well. And they will likely all make really good technicians because this is kind of their chosen path or their chosen career. And they realize this, these are the, the, the targets of the milestones they have to hit if they want to be successful. Um, but yeah, it, it literally almost is a full circle journey for me at this yeah, point. That's an awesome way to describe it. It's, it's, it's kind of cool to look back yeah. on it and, and give back some of the tips that, uh, you know, that I've learned over the years. I mean, I, I worked with a couple of guys when I was co-op and then apprenticing and they were, they were fantastic mentors. I learned a lot from them and I taught them a couple of things because they hadn't recently been to trade school and I would come back from trade school and we'd, you know, plug in some data or we were looking at some scan tool data and they didn't quite know how to interpret it. I had a pretty good idea how to interpret it. And all of a sudden, hey, the, the co-op kid kind of knows what he's talking about. So there's, there's a point in your career where you will get to prove yourself as an apprentice. And it may not be today or tomorrow, but, and now I'm on the other side of that. And I, I get to kind of, you know, reiterate some of the, the learning moments that I've gone through. And, and I've had students over the years that will, you know, reach out to me a year later. Hey, got my license. Thanks very much. And remember that story you told us about that component? I've seen three of those in the last couple of months and they don't necessarily understand the value of that analogy at the time. Mm -hmm. But once they've spent a little more time in the yep. trade, they go, hey, yep. hey, guy kind of knew what he was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. What advice would you give to people thinking about getting into this trade, getting into this area? It's a tough start. Um, I'll be you know, totally honest. It is a tough start. It's tough to get going. Um, there are expenses. I mean, you're buying your own tools for the most part. There are government incentives in place to help with that. There are bursaries in place. Um, none of those existed when I was going through my apprenticeship. So there are mechanisms in place to try and help set or, or offset the cost of, of purchasing tools. Uh, you will have to prove yourself as an apprentice. It's it's tough to get started because a lot of the licensed guys, oh, here comes another co-op student, here comes another apprentice, another newbie, another junior, and you've already, you're behind that eight ball already when you start. And so you really have to kind of prove yourself. You have to put your best foot forward. You have to strive for, I want to learn this. I'm passionate about this. I like cars. And it's not just because I've seen a whole bunch of TV shows, but because I understand or I want to know how things work and what makes things tick in a, you know, mechanical environment or mechanical world. So if, if people are considering getting into this industry, uh, it's a fantastic industry to get into. There are lots of rewards. And even if it's not something you want to do for the rest of your life, once you're, I mean, I was 15 years on the bench, right? I started in about 89 and I got into teaching in about 2005. So I was 15 years on the bench and I really enjoyed what I did. There's always other avenues. There's always other you know, paths that you can go down and take that knowledge with you, whether you step into a service advisor role, whether you open up your own shop, whether you're in a, a custom fabrication or restoration, whether you get into teaching, whether it's, you know, evenings in the part-time or it's, or it's a full-time day job, there's lots of other avenues. Um, but it, it is a tough start, but it's a very rewarding query. And I used to love going home at the end of the day and being uh, physically drained because it's fit, but you you felt that a feeling of accomplishment when you found that problem or you fix that clunk or the customer was so thrilled. I've been to three shops and they haven't been able to find this noise or find out why that doesn't happen. And you're, you're able to solve that. So there's such an immediate level of gratification that a lot of careers probably don't offer because it's, it's one after the other and after and great. When that project is done, you get a little feather in your cap and it's on the next project, but they could be few and far between. They could be six months apart. Whereas the automotive industry there is that level of reward, in my opinion, that you saw on an on a almost daily basis. So it's, it's, it is a rewarding career and it's, it's a tough start, but uh, it is something that, is a, that it will pay dividends down the road if you put the, the time and the effort into it. Yeah, yeah. So what's next for you? Can I use the R word? Oh, yeah, I know that <laughs> word. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, my, my retirement is, is the next five-year goal for me. Okay. So, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm creeping up on it slowly okay. and I, I'm 
my wife and I have lots of things that we want to do. She, she retired early. Okay. So uh, she's been already retired for a couple of years, but has been doing some part-time work with Conestoga teaching in the school of business. Yeah. So there's a, a bit of a collaboration there and we can go home and, and either, you know, celebrate a, a victorious light bulb day, or we gripe about the way some of the programs work. And so yeah, we, we get along really well that way. So she's looking forward to retirement. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to retirement. That would be the next step. Well, getting there. Yeah. Well, let's hang on though. Wait, wait a second. What will you do in retirement? I will have all kinds of things to do. Okay. Uh, I am forever tinkering with things you know, moving things, fixing things, improving things, renovating things. Um, my goal is to, to build a small hobby shop uh, on, our, on our property. And I will take on a, an old classic car project. And I've said this to a lot of friends and coworkers is I would love to get a, you know, a late 60s, early 70s vehicle and then fill it full of modern technology. Nice. What, what would be the vehicle? I would like to get my hands on a probably a late 70s, uh, late 60s, early 70s, uh, A-body Chrysler. Nice. So an old Duster, a Demon, a Dart, something like that. Maybe gotcha. even an E-body, a Challenger. And then stuff a modern day 5.7 or a 6.4 Hemi into it. So on the outside, you've got all the classic looks. But on the inside, you've got the modern instrumentation. You've got the push button start. You've got the efficiency, the reliability, the economy just as a project and, and it could stem from there. So that's, that's kind of a retirement project or a retirement goal. And we've got other toys, both my, my wife and I ride motorcycles. So there's always, you know, tinkering and maintenance and, and cleaning and places to go. Uh, we enjoy traveling. We try and do at least one major motorcycle trip every year. We've been down to Arkansas. Uh, she's been out to the West coast. We've been to the East coast. We spent a week riding around Newfoundland several years ago. So yeah, we've, we've done a fair bit of riding and yeah, I mean, that's all, all part of our, our time too. So now we'll have a little more time to do that and, and some of the other travels that go with it. I don't think there's going to be any shortage of things for me to do, not because I have a huge honeydew list, but because I've, I'm looking forward to doing things on my time and, and when I want, and if I want to have a lazy day, I can have a lazy day. I, I think I've earned it at this point. <laughs> I would say so. Thank you so much. No this has been amazing. It's been a fantastic opportunity. It's yeah. uh, I, I enjoy kind of, you know, passing on information or passing on education as, as yeah. an educator, as a teacher, but uh, I enjoy talking about the, the past that I got that, that it took me to get there as well. And, and, you know, hopefully uh, people that are listening or people that are considering the trade or the industry, it, it is absolutely a, a rewarding trade. It's, it's not an easy one. And it's, yep. you know, you, it's tough to get started. It's tough to, uh, to, to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel, but stick with it. Um, and the day will get there. Absolutely. And it's not all about the, the hard grunt, heavy lifting. There's a lot of other pieces of the automotive trade that are, are much more, they're cleaner. You're doing, you know, diagnostics, you're doing wiring, you're doing, uh, reprogramming and software. Yeah. And it doesn't always have to be the dirt and the grease that it was the, the days of the nut and the bolt. They're still there, but there's such a, a broader facet to that industry. Now. Thank you. Wow, what a great conversation. Thank you for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Careers. If you liked this episode and want to hear more, follow us on Spotify and subscribe on YouTube. See you in the next one.